Today, we are going to talk about how missile sensors track a target. And you will never believe where we are going to end up. Coming up. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. We are going to cover radar tracking, but the same concept, the same ideas can be applied to different types of tracking with just the difference of the sensor being used. Tracking a target is a process that seems relatively simple, we humans do it intuitively. In its most basic form, the tracking process is as follows. So, the radar scans a portion of space around it, and this is called an update. The radar identifies a target, and in this context we say that it has obtained a plot. The decision of tracking is made by a human controller, in case of a radar of a fighter, or by the guidance electronics, in the case of a missile. So, the radar starts to scan the angular region centered around the plot. It can be a circular scan, can be any other pattern, doesn't matter for us. If, after a new update, the plot is no longer in the geometric center of the pattern, the following scan will use the plot position as the new geometric center of the scan. So the process is repeated and repeated and repeated and by following the movement of the radar beam it is possible to identify the target position and show it on a screen or feed it to a guidance electronic. So it seems fairly easy, what could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out that a lot of things can go wrong, and they normally do. First, you need to understand that the plot is not a track. A plot is a single dot on a screen, a single echo received by the radar. A track is a record of information about the target. It may contain the target position, the velocity, the acceleration, and even other non-kinematic informations like the IFF reply, or the track quality, or the call sign, or anything relevant. You may easily understand that a single plot can give you the target position eventually, but is not going to give you the velocity, is not going to give you the acceleration, and is not going to give you the other informations that are required to make a track. In general, you need multiple plots to make a track. Computer, like the one guiding a missile, need to execute a number of tasks to feed a good track to the rest of the guidance electronics. It must decide if a plot is part of an existing track or a new track is needed, it must update the existing tracks, a process that is known as smoothing. More about this in a minute. It must decide if a track needs to be terminated because there are no more plots to be associated with it. Well, in an ideal world, all of this would be easy, but as I said before, a lot of things can go wrong. The radar itself makes mistakes. Distance and position from plot to plot, even for a stationary target, may vary because of the intrinsic radar errors and not because of the target movement. Some other plots can be completely false echoes generated by anomalous propagation, weather patterns uh, of the ground or even intentional jamming. You may expect these errors to be small and irrelevant, but look at this infamous track. Some Italians will be familiar with it. These are the last moments of a DC-9 that crashed into the Tyrrhenian Sea in 1980 for causes that are still controversial to this day. 
It was a terrible tragedy, but I am not discussing the events now. Just notice that this is 1980, so technology is by no means still primitive, and still tracks are scattered by kilometers left and right of the flight path. And the problem is even worse when multiple targets are close to each other because they are difficult to single out and tell which is which. But also the targets can have unpredictable movements like for example a sharp loss of altitude because of turbulence or uh, high G maneuvers. And finally, a radar on a missile is actually moving, so it is subject to any sort of vibration, shaking, and any kind of disturbances. So, creating and maintaining a track out of single plot is no small task, but there do exist algorithms that just do this job. The simplest algorithm is just identifying a gate around the position and choosing the strongest plot within the gate. Other algorithms try to predict the future position on the basis of the last few updates and then they choose the plot closest to the predicted position. The most sophisticated try to calculate the probability of a plot being part of a track by statistical methodologies. Now that we have associated a plot to a track, are we good to go? Well, not really. There is another problem. A track where the plots are scattered, as we have seen before, is not particularly useful. This is particularly true in the case of a missile. The weapon will overcorrect. It will be chasing the plot. This means that it will make a lot of maneuvers, it will burn a lot of energy, and as we have seen in various previous videos, this is bad. So what you really need to do is to smooth the track to have a nice clean trajectory to be fed to the guidance electronics. And obviously the trajectory should be the closest possible to the actual target trajectory because otherwise you will be sidetracking the missile. The Kalman filter is not a filter like an oil filter or an air filter, it is not a thing. It is a mathematical methodology invented in the late 50s by Rudolf Kalman at the University of Southern California to make estimates when you have measures that depend from laws and they are measured with sensors that have statistical errors, which is basically just our case. The mathematics is not terribly complicated and there are excellent videos that describe it on YouTube if you are interested. I will just try to give an idea of the reasoning behind it. Those who already know the subject will forgive me if I'm not 100% correct and if I cut some corners. Let's suppose we have a plot on a flat plane for the sake of simplicity. And let's assume that we already know that this is part of a track, so we also have the velocity. So we know that we have errors, so the real target position is probably not where the plot is, but somewhere nearby. For example, within this blob. The darker the blob, the highest the probability that the target is actually there. In these conditions, if we try to predict the plot position for the next update while well, knowing the old position, the velocity and the blob characteristic, well, the result of our prediction can only be another blob, let's say there. And by the way, in real life we can become very sophisticated with our predictions. We can consider the acceleration, for example, or we can use even complex motion laws, even nonlinear laws, 
that describe how the target could move in this place. As a practical example, we know that the plane can stop in midair and go backward. So obviously this place is limitation to where the next position can actually be. The second blob is somewhat bigger than the first because as the time passes, the incertitude is obviously growing. Then the update comes and the plot is inside the boundaries of the second blob, as expected. Cool. However, we still have the same problem. We don't know which is the real target position. Now the incertitude is even bigger. What can we do about that? Well, we know the characteristics of our radar and we know which kind of errors it is making. So, if the second plot is there, we may say that this is also within a second blob which represents the radar errors, like this. Haha, <laughs> now we say something, the intersection of the two blobs is a much, much smaller region. Since the two blobs represent two probability distribution, in the intersection there will be a point where the combined probability of the target being there is the highest. And that will be the most likely place where the target is going to be. This is going to be the position that we are going to feed to the guidance electronic. And by the way, if we use the intersection as the starting point for the prediction of the next update, we are starting from a much smaller blob. Job done! In the real world, the Kalman filter turned out to be very, very effective, and today it is used by the vast majority of the guidance systems, or at least the available sources say so. It has the advantage of being relatively simple to implement and not being too memory and computationally heavy. And since it provides a very smooth output, a very smooth track, it also works well with the optimized flight profiles that modern weapons are trying to fly. So overall the process goes like this. The tracking starts, the update returns a plot, the tracker tries to associate it to a track, the filter smooths position, acceleration and speed errors, the smoothed data are fed to the autopilot, which gives, in turn, commands to the actuators that steer the missile. The actual outcome of the commands is measured by GPS, inertial platforms, uh, accelerometers, the outcome is fed back to the tracker and the cycle starts over. Ok, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the process of associating a plot to a track may go wrong. Most of the electronic countermeasures at different level of sophistication and with different means try to mess with the association process, trying to, for example, induce uh, early termination of the track. Stealth, in this perspective, can make track initiation problematic and track update, uh, well, very complex. In a more subtle way, the common filter has its own weaknesses, rooted in the mathematics. For example, this process of intersection may not be as clear as we have shown in our animation before. But maybe, just maybe I am inferring here, there could be a deeper vulnerability. As we have seen, the filter uses the motion laws to make a prediction. So in the case of the missiles, it is actually assuming that the target is a plane and it is flying like a plane. What if this is not the case? I am not talking about UFOs. Actually, you sometimes hear the pilots saying that their system couldn't track 
a UFO when they are describing the sighting, but this is not relevant for our discussion. Helicopters then? Yes, but the way they behave and fly is well known, and anyway they are slow and low targets with low energy, they are easy targets anyway. So, what's the point you will be asking? Well, what about those Russian planes with vector thrust and super maneuverability? Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.